Welcome to another episode of Scaling Secrets. Today, we're going to cover how to become a publicist, how to get into PR, how to get into broadcasting, what the education looks like, what your experience needs to look like, and each step with like that. So today, I have Greg with me. He is a professional broadcaster, uh, just recently promoted to account strategist at P- Otter PR, and he's going to walk us through his experience. Yeah, everybody's uh, experience is going to be a little different, but I think there's some things you can take along the way from our conversation I think might be beneficial for a lot of people who are wondering, uh, can I get into to PR and does broadcasting help in any capacity? Yeah. So let's just start off with the basics, education. What it, yeah. kind of education do you do and was it your goal to get into broadcasting? What was your goal? So I went to Duquesne University back right. in Pittsburgh. That's where I'm, I'm from. And actually, my first two years was in business. I come from a, a family that uh, mainly educators, but my grandfather was an accountant, and it was uh, an opportunity where Duquesne had a pretty good business school. Mm-hmm. Hey, you can graduate, get a job right away. And, yep. You know, that's always the, the spiel that Accounting's you get. Accounting is a great career. Yeah, accounting is a great career. Boring. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a great career. I'm not great with numbers. My wife will probably tell you that. Um, in terms of just, you know, I can I can give you some guesstimates, but like sometimes the specifics, I I don't like to get too far into the specifics with uh, a lot of numbers. So, anyways, after two years of that, I was just like, I, I don't like it. I didn't do really well, <laughs> to be honest. And um, I, I made the switch to journalism. Now, Duquesne really didn't have a broadcasting school per se, so it's an interesting story. I um, started to first did a couple of internships, which were huge. I mean, I, I would advise anybody that's looking to get into broadcasting PR, do do some internships. One was TV, one was radio. Which Just one was better? I probably did more with the TV, actually, because, you know, I'd have to go to high school games. I'd interview coaches. Okay. I'd have to interact with players. I remember one specific instance, we covered a – University of Pittsburgh basketball game, and at the end, it's the time when Pitt really wasn't as good as they were a few years ago, I had to interview some of the players. That's I was cool. the only one there. So you can imagine. You got real you know, experience. You got real life experience, and you're talking to some college uh, athletes, and that can be a little intimidating, I think, for anybody. But you know what? It was a great training ground. So from that standpoint, that was phenomenal. That, How did that you side. get the internship? What was that process like? So... It was, you know, you threw school, yeah. you know, you apply and they have a, I think most schools have a program where they can help you get those internships and, you know, you kind of say, look, this is where I want to focus okay. and, you know, there is some competition yeah, and, uh, you know, you just hope that uh, your application goes through and they like what you see, you go through the interview process and, uh, you know, it, it worked out well and uh, everybody was great. They're really helpful. Once you get into those internships, most people want to see you succeed yeah. and um, as an intern, you know, just a little tip, uh, put your head down, do what they tell you. <laughs> it's it's not bad to keep asking questions, though, because you're there to learn, too. And I wouldn't get too caught up if it's a paid internship or not. Mine wasn't. We were just talking about that. I think most internships now are paid. They are. I believe they kind of made a transition. I'm sure there are some labor laws that were. Probably. <laughs> um, <laughs> Probably. I know my internships were paid, but yeah. a lot of my friends in marketing and PR and communications right. were not paid. And there was no such thing as paid unless you... No had a connection and your your parents got you into something it was probably and i'm a little older but i mean probably in the early 2000s paid internships wasn't as big of a deal yeah you just got the college credit and the experience right. and that was enough right. and you know and and i was very thankful for that so the tv side was great the radio side was great too i mean the key is you're, you're involved in a lot of these different atmospheres whether it's covering a game being around a a pro sports team mm-hmm. how to act one of the things that I, I would advise too, when you're you're interning, just kind of observe the behavior of people. How to act when there's a bunch of media members in a room. How to dress appropriately. You would be surprised when you you go to some of these events. I mean, there are people who look like they just rolled out of bed. Yep. And I do think appearance matters to an extent. Look professional. I think it'll make you you feel better and you'll stand out. A bit more, but I I think those are some tips you would take if you want to intern in broadcasting, journalism, whatever it is, kind of get right in there, ask questions, also keep your head down, show up on time, and always be somebody who's willing to take on a task that uh, may seem impossible because I think think your employee will will appreciate it. Yeah. So you started in business. Did you finish in business or did you switch? No, no. So I switched journalism. Okay. uh, My junior year. So I had a... um, 
you know, take some summer classes to kind of get caught up. And Duquesne didn't have a broadcasting school. It's journalism, writing, whatever. So that was fine. It actually helped me become a better writer. I had one of probably the most impactful professors I had. And it's probably not a surprise. He had real life experience. He was still writing. Yeah. Um, as a journalist, um, Dr. Mike Dillon. He was he was just a bulldog. And this is going to kind of get into being a publicist and now an account strategist. Just asking the questions. Always finding an angle. How to make your story interesting. I think there's a lot of connections there between a publicist in many ways and an actual journalist. There's, there's a lot of synergies there. He was very impactful. Really learned how to write. What I also did was, though, I, I went to our student newspaper and I, I wanted to cover sports. That's what I did growing up, and I loved sports talk radio at the time. And I would write columns pertaining to the professional sports teams in the Pittsburgh area. So there was a lot to, to write about, and they agreed to it, which was great. Sometimes they don't. It has to be more of what's going on in campus. But they were like, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Go ahead and do it. So that was pretty neat. I got a chance to do that, and it was kind of cool going back and looking at those clippings from – you know, 2000 to 2003, and uh, see what the writing style was like. But what I also did, and what I'm most proud of, I would take my tape recorder. This is out dating myself a little <laughs> bit here. I, I would take my tape recorder. I would go into the stands and watch the basketball team, and I would do play by play. I would just sit there. I'd nice. have, and I, it was like a real life recording, and I'd have a buddy who would do stats. And he wanted to do color commentary, too. So, you know, we're passing this, this little recorder around. And I did that for the whole season. And that ended up being a lot of my resume tape. That's awesome. So now you re do broadcasting for the, the for Tampa Bay Lightning. Tampa Bay Lightning. Yeah. That's an awesome – I mean, that's huge. That's a big team that has it is. national recognition. So what was – I'm assuming that was a goal of yours. You know, the goal – the goal was to do, I think, eventually play by play. Okay. Now I've been very fortunate for any Pittsburgh. team. Just for any team, yeah, okay. really. Uh, you know, when I graduated, again, I had to go to a professional studio, and we made probably a couple hundred CDs. Again, you know, different than it is <laughs> today, and it was a lot of the content that I had put on that tape recording. Yeah. Play by play basketball. We also did a talk show. On, on Duquesne's campus. So you kind of faked it. You just recorded yourself, and it wasn't going anywhere, but you, right. you used that as your reel. That, that's exactly what that's it was. Awesome. That's exactly what it was. And, you know, I was sending it out to minor league baseball teams. I mean, I, I was willing to, you know, they always tell you, be willing to move around. You know, you've bounced yeah, around. I mean, that's, I that's, what you, that's what you, you pro that's some other advice I would. If that's, if that's really what you want to do, you become more attractive if you're willing to move around. Absolutely. You really do. And, and I, Give up your your goal of the salary and the location to start for sure, and get as close to the dream job as you can because it'll help you through that career and help line up the rest of it for you. Right, because and you you post about this a lot, and I think it's true. Those failures that you learn as somebody just growing up and finding your voice in whatever profession it is makes you the person who I think eventually you want to become or have become. So it lucked it lucked out where. There was a producer position in Pittsburgh in radio, and it was part-time, and I took it. I was living at home. That dovetailed into, hey, we just got broadcasting rights to the University of Pittsburgh basketball, both men and women, and also football. I immediately said, I'm interested in doing anything I can. Absolutely. And I ended up being the network producer for Pitt basketball and football, which meant now I'm on a plane. Mm-hmm. Now I'm traveling That's fun. with coaches, with players who eventually some of them turn pro. But what was really interesting, and again tying it into the PR aspect, I got a chance to work with a lot of the PR people yep. for those universities yeah. and those sports teams. So you had a chance to see a press release because you were getting them. Right. And you know, how they reacted and how they took media requests. We find that journalists have the best ability to write because they know what the other side's yeah. looking for. For and sure. they, you know how to set up an interview. You know how to ask questions. No doubt. So it really helps a lot. It did. And um, the producing aspect did too. So I ended up being a producer, I was, I was saying, for a radio show. But then I started to do play-by-play -play for women's basketball. And the way things are set up today with college athletics, the women 
get treated basically the same as the men in terms of like the travel. Right. We were going first class charter. I mean, it, th- I've that never experience. done that. That's awesome. <laughs> it was incredible. I mean, like, awesome. at, like for the football games, also, you had a police escort. Yep. How cool is that? You have a police escort from the airport to the stadium mm-hmm. and vice versa. So you see all this traffic that's going on. And you're but shooting if right through you're it. on three buses with the, the football team and you're just going right to the airport. And it was just, it was really cool. And then, you know, they feed the guys right after the game, before the game. I mean, it's just being exposed to it opened you up a little bit more to how things go in other areas, which is pretty neat. When did your career start shifting? So you got that first job in broadcasting and producing. What was kind of the next step? So I I would say a lot of it came with the pit stuff. So I was doing, you know, executive producing. I was also doing play-by-play. So that was a lot of fun because Madison Square Garden, you're covering all these tournaments, but like you're calling games there. And it's... That's awesome. But that led to other things though. So that led to, hey, um... ESPN Plus needs uh, somebody to do locally the play-by-play for Pitt versus, you know, one of their non-conference games. There I am. Yeah. On a TV doing play-by-play for a Pitt game. That was really cool. And then that dovetailed into, hey, um, can you be the the post-game host for the Pirates Radio Network? Yeah. So you're going to be taking calls. You're going to be talking about each game uh, and recapping it. Awesome. That dovetailed into a morning show. I had my own morning show uh, for almost a year from 6 to 10 on an AM station, Fox 970 at the time, and four hours by yourself. That's a talking. That's hard. Woo! I circle through these. <laughs> They're hour max. That's why I always say, you know, I always laugh when um, you have, well, especially some, uh, let's, let's bring it back to some of our clients. Yeah. And they get a podcast or radio hit. And they're like, oh, jeez. Can you get the questions in advance? I don't. I mean, I don't know what I'm going to talk about. And I'm thinking, they obviously don't have the experience. I'm thinking, right. man, I tell you what, four hours of doing a show by yourself, you can talk about anything. Prepare, I mean, you really can. You really can. So you try. <laughs> you try and calm down. Like, listen, this is just going to be an opportunity for you to talk about what you can do. It's not going to be bad. And once they get going, they start to open up from that perspective. And you can even see with me, who is still getting experience at the beginning, I always start off a little bit faster. I stutter a little bit. And then as you start talking, it's natural to get into that conversation. It is. is. We see that a lot with our clients. Right. And it's hard. Yeah. I think last time you and I did a a podcast, really, the biggest thing is this is experience. The more you do it, you're going to feel a little bit more comfortable. Now, we have some things here at Otter where we can help with that process to make you feel comfortable. But I think a lot of it is just repetition so let's jump back into getting getting into pr getting into broadcast getting into communications yeah what's one of the biggest takeaways through your career that you're like i wish i knew that earlier i would say the ability to jump around a little bit more um i was fortunate in many ways to stay in pittsburgh right but i know a lot of people grew as whether it's a broadcast or producer, not only in their profession, but maybe in life in general, of having to go and pursue it somewhere else. You know, maybe in a small town that nobody, you have no friends, nobody's heard of you, and it's a real grind. So uh, in some ways, we kind of did that when we moved to Florida. But I think early on, um, I, I would advise, if you can, if you can, to take in those experiences, especially when you're younger, and maybe you don't have the family right off the bat, too. I think that'll help. But don't be afraid to experience because you can always come back home. Right. You can always come back home. I mean, all my jobs were out of the state and yeah. until I started my own business. I never worked in, in the right. state that I grew up until yeah. I was my own boss. There you go. When you talk about jumping around, so obviously we're talking about location, but also moving in careers. How quickly, how fast is too fast? Cause I know as a recruiter, if I see someone that's changed their jobs three times in three years, I'm not interested in working with them. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a tr- actually a really good point. And even if there's gaps, right, in your resume, right. there may be some, some problems. I, probably like anything, Scott, I think things have changed today, how we see those things that maybe we did 15, 20 years ago. I think Absolutely. the job market's different, working from home, that hybrid uh, part of things, I think, makes it a, a little more challenging. I, I think if you, you are somebody who has bounced around, I think 
would it would it raise some red flags? I, it it may. And at least if you're somebody who's interviewing that person, you're right. doing your due diligence to make no, you're sure. Definitely asking. Why are you Why are you doing why are you doing this? <laughs> so that's that's all I I can say. I think you know one of the things we we have talks in my house at, with my wife is there's a little bit of a, a loyalty gap I think sometimes with um, people who start out uh, at a job and is the grass always greener somewhere else? For some people it might. Yeah. For some people it might. I think it's how you go about the process though. I agree. And you you, you can leave a place in a better shape than you started yeah. and explain that's for your professional growth right. and that transition should be good. It but should. if you jump in six months, less than a year, you do an average job and then you rip them out at a bad time, that's not sure. going to look good for you. You're not going to get that recommendation letter. Like it's it's right. just it's not good for your career. I, I I would agree. And I think you know, we go back to the example of, you know, what did you learn a little bit when you were interacting with all these sports teams and media members how to be a professional yes how to and i don't know you know that maybe there are classes today for that there <laughs> seems like there's a class for anything probably <laughs> e-learning but, you know dress well speak well but i think you know whether you want to call it manners whether you want to call it professionalism you need to treat the place you work at with a certain amount of respect and i think in today's culture we forget that. It is often about me, me, me. And look, to an extent, we're all guilty of that. But there are other people who are relying on you, who have given you an opportunity where I think you need to owe them a little bit more than, hey, I'm just, I'm bailing after a week yeah. after I've been here for six months. Yeah. So let's talk about your transition into PR. Was Otter PR your first role as a publicist or did you have Obviously, you had experience in the space, but were you doing it with other companies? What does that look like? No. So, I mean, I, I say, you know, I've been in the broadcast business, the media business for 20 years. So I feel like in many ways, that's my, that oh, was absolutely. my training. But in terms of actually being a publicist, uh, Otter was my first. Okay. For sure. And uh, very fortunate for that opportunity. It was more, you know, I think doing the broadcasting, which is great, but, uh, you know, wanting to be challenged, trying something different and seeing if you can push yourself even a little bit more. And so when the opportunity came about with Otter, um, my wife and I were like, this, this, I, I, I won't forget it because I, we were talking about the interviewing process and everything that, that Otter had to offer. I remember saying to her and, and she echoed it, it felt right. Yeah. And I, I don't, I haven't had that happen too often when it comes to opportunities. Broadcasting, you're going to go a lot of different directions with it. Very rarely you're going to get your dream job, especially coming right out of school. Absolutely. But I, I think in terms of the process, what the goal was at Otter, clients, getting them to the media, I looked at it and I said, you know, I can do that. It felt right. And uh, lo and behold, it did. Yeah. And you, you've been promoted pretty quickly. You just became an account strategist. Yeah. And as a publicist, I believe you went through a couple of tiers before you made that jump. So within a year, three, four times that you've been had kind of a, a yeah. jump. What does that look like? Obviously, you've had success because of your background experience, but what are you really doing that's kind of helping you succeed that quickly? So I, I do think the professional experience probably has helped more than maybe even I give it credit for. Yeah. You know, being able to handle a client, mm -hmm. you know, because every client's different. And look, there's, there's some clients that are just impossible. <laughs> Let's just be honest. You know, um, we want to be frank. You know, you, you get a lot of a great success for them, and it's like, oh, what do you, what else, what else are you getting for me? Expectation and managing yeah. is very hard, and of right. course, you're dealing with business owners and entrepreneurs. For so, sure. You know, my goal is a, a billion dollars, and Correct. I'm nowhere near that. Obviously, a billion's not the goal, but right. to everyone's expectations, they want to be the best. They do. Yeah, they do. And I think you've got to temper those a little bit, and and that's fine. Um, I do think the interacting with professional athletes, coaches, uh, being in an arena filled with 50, 60,000 people, you may not seem like that that translates to what I do, but you're not in awe. Let's put it that way. You're not in awe of anything, you and know, and I think that that helps. The pressure of that communication is off because you're a natural communicator. That is correct. And, you know, there is – you will have pressure when you are doing – I'll never forget the, the first – time I was an executive producer for a major broadcast I put on the headsets and I had 25 different people talking my headset oh I no. went to myself I went how in the world am I going to be able to just communicate and you know what after a while it slows down like anything else yeah it slows down you're able to say okay I need to talk to him her him and 
the other thing too was at the time I was 23, 24, I'm in the booth with the radio voice of Pitt, but also the Steelers, Bill Hillgrove, huge legend, still is to this day. And here I am, very green, telling him when to break. Yep. Or hey, Bill, you got to wrap it up. You yeah. know, and that <laughs> you find yourself in those moments. Though. Absolutely. You know, you find it, and there's always rough patches. How do you learn from those mistakes? Too, I think helps. But I think again, just kind of being in that environment allows you to think quickly, handle different people, and also prioritize too, which I think you have to do as a publicist. And that's hard for everyone and yeah, for I, sure you get a thousand ideas and projects oh. and you're you're running around and nothing right. gets done properly right. exactly so a, a large piece of your success is the media success that your clients are getting i mean that's at the end yeah. of the day our goal is to retain clients and make them happy and successful you're getting massive media success you have a journalism background you've been doing broadcasting are you using previous relations or is it just how you're telling stories what are you doing that's different yeah i mean i wish i could say i was using a lot of my my connections but I don't have any sports clients. <laughs> <laughs> we got to fix that. <laughs> Which is fine. I mean, it, but it, that's even, I think, more of a reason to sit there and say the it's more of the experience yeah. that is translated, not necessarily what field or specific field that I've been in that, that's allowed to have some pretty good success. I think, I think it's a couple of things. Um, when I started here, too, who you listen to? You know, uh, Mark Cayley's a, a, a big part of, of what Otter does for sure. Um, he was basically my account strategist. Again, even though I was a little, listen. Listen to your bosses. See if you can absorb things they tell you that's worked for them. Don't be afraid to ask questions. And I ask a lot of questions. So that has helped. And then I think you start to realize, okay, what is what would work for you if you were on the other side of it? Right. Shorter the better. Right to the point. Yes. Get me. Get me. What do you want to talk about? What is your client good at? Your client's good at uh, tiny cottages. Okay, I Let's sold. I sold that one. <laughs> you did. <laughs> I I always I and and Justin Draplin from Eclipse Cottages. Yeah. Um, he's been with us uh, from the start when I started. Great client. I always um, get excited seeing the clients that I've talked to have success. I know. I know. Especially when you're on the call, because I mean, <laughs> PR sometimes it just doesn't get picked up, and when you you tell someone that you're gonna do a good job for them, and then you get to actually do the good job for I them, know. and you're just like, that's so cool. Yeah, it is. It is. And there's no bigger rush, even right now transitioning where I am now as an account strategist, when you work hard to get your client in the media. Mm -hmm. And then you, you kind of do a search to find, oh, Fox Business picked them up. Bloomberg picked That's That never gets old. No. That never gets old. So n now with your new role, you have a team underneath you. Yes. So you're, you're doing more management, more guidance, more right. coaching, and more strategy. Yeah. What does that experience look like? What kind of tips do you have there? So time management is probably the biggest thing. The the thing that's been, I don't want to say the most challenging, is just trying to get an understanding of their clients. Right. So I had anywhere between, what, 12, 14, 15 clients of my own. When you're transitioning now, you have a lot more than that. And at least for me, I want to have an idea of what those clients do. I don't have to know them forward and backwards. You right. know, that's the publicist's job. But I, I need to have an idea what are the problems? How can I help? I also think supporting your publicist Absolutely. is something that probably is a little underrated. And people are like, well, what do you mean by that? You know, show up on those calls if you can. Um, yeah. A lot of times, I think there are there is true strength in numbers. A lot of times clients will have maybe three or four people on a call. And maybe it's the publicist. There's only one publicist. Yeah. And maybe it's, you know, it was a bad week. And, you know, they're they're peppering the publicists <laughs> left and right. You know, hey, why aren't I in Forbes? Why aren't I in Wall Street Journal? Um, I think it's nice to have somebody in there in your corner that can then receive it and then and then professionally give it back and say, OK, look, here's here's what we're doing. Here's the process. It takes a little time. And and I think being there is a is a big deal. Yeah. Moving from an individual contributor to a team manager yeah. is difficult for a lot of people. Can be. Very difficult and adds a whole new level of stress and relearning yeah. what you think it is to be a professional. Obviously, you've had experience as a pro project manager before. Kind of what strategies are you bringing in and kind of what are some of the, the harder things you've been dealing with? So I think the biggest thing is, is to get engaged right off the bat. Yeah. Be supportive right off the bat. Communication. Mm -hmm. So I like to communicate with my team collectively all the time throughout the day and some of it is tip of the day 
I like to do a little tip. I like hey, that. Here's what I do. Try and do it on your side. Um, it's just advice, but it's allowed me to be successful. Here's what I would do. And I think that message is resonating. Obviously, hey, stay in contact with your clients. I used to be somebody who would get on the phone with my clients. We probably don't do enough of that. And I yeah. think that's the generation too. I, I But there's nothing Texting like... Texting versus phone calls. And, and Yeah. But you know, I'm a little more old school. I'd pick up the phone. I'd call. Yeah. Hey. And you know what? I'd say with half my clients, they probably appreciated that. I'm trying to get our team to get into that mode of just trying to interact with as much comfort that you have with your client. Because I think the more you do, the better. And I, I, my team for sure has done a great job of that. And they're also working together. That's the other thing. Like, I want all the publicists to be successful. One way to do that is if you have a similar client in a similar field, see if you can multi-pitch together. Yeah. You know, see if, hey, you may set up an interview for somebody else, but maybe that's going to come back for you in a couple of weeks with your client. And work together. And I think that's one of the things we do for our team meetings on Mondays is I tell them to come with what's trending in your field. Let's start talking about what we can do to attack the week. And you know what? The participation has been great. Everybody's coming with ideas. We're talking about things. And, you know, that five-minute meeting usually turns into a 20-minute meeting where yeah. we're, we're talking about it. I think that goes a long way for a publicist if they see that the account strategist is emotionally, physically invested and their success. Yeah, feeling like you have that support and Correct. someone to call and talk to that's actually going to yeah, care. Right. Um, so we look back at your career. You've had an amazing career so far. W is there anything you would have changed education-wise? Obviously, you changed your your major midway through. What If you're going to map this out to get to where you are or above towards your goals, what kind of tips would you give on that education side? So the education side... I, do I regret the the path I took? No, I'm not one of those people that you know, right. I, I'm. It, it happened for a reason. Here we are. But I would say this: I think for anybody wanting to go into journalism, public relations, anything more in the communications field, as a backup, if you can, maybe major in a profession where, if you have to keep that journalism degree on hold for a bit because you just got to pay bills or, you know, look, times are tough. Everybody goes through challenges. Maybe try and find a profession where you can you can get a job pretty quickly. And it could be a, a trade school, too. I mean, I, whatever it is, I don't know if I would make journalism the major. Okay. Um, and look, I, I, I tend to agree with you. I did it. So I'm going against what I said. I feel fortunate that I was able to be I don't want to say fast track, but successful pretty quickly to do it. I understand. There's a lot of people, they're still grinding away doing another job, and they're doing, let's say, podcasting on the side. Broadcasting is very competitive. Journalism is very competitive. competitive. Way competitive. And to throw a little wrench in there, ChatGBT is making it. Heck I yeah. don't know how that's going to affect the next generation, but there's you're going to lose some of that creativity, and it, things are definitely changing. They are. Especially in the TV space. <laughs> they are, and... Uh, you know, you see a lot of layoffs, especially in communications. Look, the radio business is... We're hiring, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you are? We are hiring. I know that because I'm getting more public <laughs> yeah. my way. We're hiring. <laughs> um, Which is great. But I would say, particularly in the communications broadcasting, minor in it. Yeah. Minor in it. And I think one of the things that we've done that's a little different in the hiring process yeah. is hiring people from different fields. Yeah. So looking for people with masters, not necessarily in communications or public relations or journalism, but business experience, people that have started their own businesses. Mark had his own business. That's why he's so su successful is because he can work directly with other entrepreneurs, other business-minded people, right. and have a better understanding of what they're actually looking at and what actually matters to them versus what a textbook says. The textbook will only take you so far. Right. And I think especially in communications, when you think about it, it's all experience. Oh, yeah. There's not much you're going to be reading. And say, oh, this is how I respond to this. I mean, honestly, you've got to get into that room with that person to figure out how you're going to respond. It's like you know, somebody punches you in the face. How are you going to respond? Anybody can sit there and say, I'm a great fighter. <laughs> and somebody punches you and knocks you out. Okay. I mean, you know, it's a little different. My background, I'm an engineer, yeah. and I took – I knew nothing about the space, and I think we've had a lot of success. And yeah. it's funny. Every once in a while, I'll see like a review or someone trying to go after me. Like, yeah, he doesn't know anything about public relations. And I'm like, 
no, I hire professionals. I know about how to how to build a system. That's but true. having different and unique perspectives in a yeah. space where it's more closed off is going to help you succeed. So if there's 200 people with a journalism degree, but I have an engineering degree, but I'm also really well spoken and good at broadcasting, I probably will stand above them because I have a different view and yeah. I can speak for sure to the language of a, a business person. Yeah. What so, you need, yeah, what you need for sure. And I think I think that's right. And I think getting different people different experiences to be able to get into a room and bounce ideas off of, I think you're able to grow a little bit as a company and, you know, even as an individual as well. Yeah, cross-functional teams are huge. Yeah. We always try to bring in, I know some of our bigger clients, Alibaba is one where we did a, a, round, a round table and you had everyone sitting around and yeah. talking about ideas and how we could kind of help them get their story out there. Yeah, I think that's, look, I think anytime you can bounce ideas off of one another, uh, whether they're all positive or some negative, I think having an open dialogue and being receptive to the fact that I may not specialize in this specific part, so I'm going to listen, and if I can implement that into the business model, I think it makes a lot of sense. Awesome. All right, Greg, it's been great having you. It's great. Any last tips before we jump off? I think one of my favorite sayings, get comfortable being uncomfortable. I love that. And I think that's one of the things in life, if you can do that, you'll be successful. But I think especially trying new things, it's never a bad thing. And I think you'll grow from that for sure. And how do people reach out to you? Uh, I prefer they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they can hit me up, obviously. Uh, uh, I could just give them the Otter email, right? I could yeah, do it. You you know? uh, so you can do the About <laughs> If you go to About Us, where and did they find me on Otter? <laughs> go to the About Us on Otter PR. You can find Greg's information. You can reach out to Hello LinkedIn, on Twitter, yeah, you know, all the other stuff. You'll be able to find me on LinkedIn as well. And uh, hey, come work. And we've got a really good team. It's a really good business, and we can certainly get you some good media hits for sure. Awesome. I appreciate it. It's great having you. Thank you, Scott.